Father, we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for bringing us here together. Lord, we lift up each one of these requests to you, and we ask you to move in each situation for those who are sick and those who are displaced and everything, Lord, every situation. We ask you to move according to your power and glory in Christ Jesus. We thank you that you're always on the side of good and always on the side of healing, always on the side of blessing. And I ask you to bless and heal and touch each one of these people. And as we go to your word this morning, I ask you to anoint me that the words I speak would not be mine, but that they would be yours, that they would be spirit and truth and would not return void, but would accomplish what you sent them to do. Or give us listening ears and open hearts to receive your word. And I praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Amen. Well, I want to talk this morning about places that we can encounter God. Um, down through my years in the ministry, it seems to me that one of the more uh, common I don't know what the right word would say. It's not really a question. It's not really a complaint, but expressions of concern I get from people is how do I get in touch with God? It seems like everybody else has these experiences with the Lord and I don't ever have an experience with the Lord or everybody else hears from God. Why don't I hear from God? And I can't find God. Where is he? And, and, you know, all variations of that. I think that's, as I said, really, really common because as Christians, we really long to encounter the Lord. We want to feel his presence. We want to hear his words to us. The psalmist said, this is Psalm 42, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? And I think that's a great expression of the way a lot of us feel a lot of the time. And I was thinking about that this week, and I was just thinking about, you know, there are places we can go or people to whom we can go, situations we can put ourselves in that won't guarantee that we get some revelation, revelatory word from God, but they definitely increase our chances. And a lot of it is not even so much where we are, but it's a matter of opening our eyes to what is around us. And so I wrote down this morning, I'm going to go through these kind of quickly because I ended up this week as I was working on this, writing down 10 places that we can encounter God that I think are both biblical and experiential that I mean you know I have places that I've experienced God myself and I decided to do all 10 of them although very quickly because the way I look at it is this if you try one of these and it doesn't work or you've tried a couple of these and they didn't work I'm giving you some extra options okay Surely one out of these 10 will hit you somewhere, okay? So 10 places that we tend to encounter God. The first couple are pretty obvious, uh, you know, and then some of, the, some of the ones I'm going to say maybe not quite so obvious. The first place I wrote down, number one, these are not in order, by the way, in importance or uh, guarantee that you'll encounter God. But the first place that we tend to encounter God, number one is we encounter God in the Bible, in his word. God lives in his word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Jesus himself was described as the word, that he didn't just give us the word. He was and is the word. And so he resides in his word. And you will 
generally, eventually, not every time you sit down to study God's word, but if you study his word on some kind of regular basis and, and in some kind of systematic way, you will almost inevitably, sooner or later, have an encounter with the Lord through his word. Not to do another advertisement, but that's to me one of the things that's always been so great about our Wednesday night Bible study. Because we pick a book of the Bible and whatever that book is, we just start at chapter 1, verse 1, and study it every verse straight through to the end of the book. Sometimes it takes us months, and sometimes it takes us more months, <laughs> years, <laughs> decades, I don't know, to get through a book. But one of the things that I've had so many people say to me all the way down through the years, going back to when we started this, in the 1990s, uh, which was in, at that time it met on Friday nights in our home. But we started this many years ago, and more than anything else that's ever happened or I've ever done in my ministry, I think, I've had more people say to me that Bible study changed my life. Bible study changed my life. And it's because God resides he and abides in his word. And so when you go into his word, you tend to find him there. You know, things come up, they bubble up. He reveals himself. The second place that we're going to encounter God, and you must know this because you're here this morning, is in church. There's something about Christianity that is revealed in community. When we get together, I tell people all the time, I get a lot of mail from people, particularly through my newspaper columns, and I cannot tell you how many people I hear from say, I don't need to go to church. I can find God sitting out on the hillside on Sunday morning. I don't need to be with a bunch of hypocrites. <coughs> I have two answers to that. <clears throat> Is go ahead and join us. We can always use one more hypocrite. <laughs> And the other thing I say is, well, you know, you can't be a Christian by yourself. I'm not saying you can't go to heaven. I'm saying you can't function as a Christian by yourself any more than you can function as a football player by yourself. Because Christianity, like football, is a team sport, okay? And it's designed for the fact that we need to worship and be in communion with other believers to really find the essence of who the Lord is. You say, well, all those people down there drive me crazy. That's the point, okay? God wants us to get together and rub those rough edges off all of us and work together. Jesus himself said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. Now, he can be with us, and I'll say more about this in a minute, when we're alone, of course he can. I love being alone. My first wife used to say, you should have just been a hermit. You were going to be a hermit. And that, there's a lot of truth to that. You know, I love solitude. Some people say, I can't stand to be by myself. You know, I can't stand to be in a crowd for very long. You know, I'm exactly the opposite. Um, but... We all need each other, and we need to be together. And in that community of believers, we will encounter the Lord. The Lord is right here with us today in this service. Did you hear what I uh, said You know, a minute ago when I read the scripture? Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. We don't have a lot of people here today or sort of, sort of still in flux getting back from the pandemic and all that. And, you know, people are kind of coming in. But I guarantee you this, we may not have as many people as we once did here, but we got more than two or three. Can you say amen? amen. We've, got, we've got a whole lot more than two or three. And so according to God's word, the Lord himself is right here today in our midst. And if you're of a mind to, you can encounter him this morning, right here, the Lord is in the, the 
worship music. The Lord is in the sermon. He's with those children worshiping downstairs. He's in our fellowship together as we talk before and after the service. He will be in the communion, in the wine, and the bread. When we, you know, he, he said, take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. He is in that communion. Can you say amen? amen. He is right. You want to encounter him? Open your eyes because he's right here today. Amen. Number three, a third place we can encounter the Lord is in our children or for some of us in our grandchildren. And if you don't have children or grandchildren, you can, you can encounter them in your other family kids, you know, or if you're a school teacher in the kids at school. But one of the things that strikes me about God himself is in the first way God presents himself in the scripture basically is as a creator of life and as a father, the father of all creation. He is the father of us all. He made us in his image, but he also made us to do what he did, which is we are capable of creating life ourselves. Isn't it amazing? You know, John uh, yesterday sent me some pictures that he had come across. He sent, sent them to me on his phone, and uh, they were pictures, a couple of different pictures, of his mom and me when we were young, in fact, the picture he sent me of her was before we were even married. I didn't even know her then. She must have been probably 14 or 15 years old. And then he sent me a picture of me, which I finally figured out. I didn't recognize anything about it. And finally figured out it was taken in the apartment where Renee, my first wife, and I lived when we were first married, the first six months of our marriage. We lived in a little apartment on Holt Avenue, and I kept thinking in that picture, that place looks familiar, but I don't know what it is, where that was taken. And then finally it, it hit me. But one of the things that struck me about that is at that point in our lives, John, the one sending me the picture, did not exist. He, not, he wasn't even a thought. I had no idea that I would ever have a son. His mom had no idea that she would ever have a son. And yet, together, we were able to create this whole life from nothing. And he came into being, and now through him and Cassie, five grandkids have come into being, and someday they're going to grow up, and they're going to have kids. You know, the scripture says that God made us male and female. He made us in his image. And one of the ways he made us in his image is we are able to do what he did with Adam and Eve, which is to create life and whole generations of life. Can you say amen? And so, you know, if you've been a parent or you've been a caretaker for a kid, uh, a foster parent or an aunt or an uncle or an older brother or sister that raised a kid, or if you've had a close association with kids, you know how much you learn about the Lord and about yourself through that, through that process of parenting and creating life. We learn so much from our children. You know, it wasn't until I had a child that it, it made sense to me that I understood how God feels about me and how much he can love me when I would see how much I love my child and I would think, well, I'm God's child. He must feel that way about me. You know, we see God in them. We see God in our children. And sometimes we see the devil in our children too. <laughs> And that teaches us a few things as well, you know. We learn about ourselves. And, and one of the interesting things is when Jesus was ministering on earth, you know, in the form of a man, he was a man. He used children 
as examples of his kingdom. Several times he would pull the children up to him and say, unless you become like this little child, you can't enter the kingdom of God. You can't understand the kingdom of God. You know, and so he was pointing to them as examples of him and his father and their kingdom and their relationship with us. And so I, I can tell you from firsthand experience, many, many times in my life, I have encountered the Lord through my son or my grandchildren. And just understanding my relationship with them is, would take the blinders off and suddenly I would see the Lord there and I would say, wow. Here's one you may not have thought of either. We can encounter God in our pets. If you have a beloved pet, you will encounter God or again, the devil sometimes in your, in your pets. We years ago had two different boxers, one after the other. And the first one I loved like a member of the family. He got loose one day and got hit by a pickup truck out in front of our house and killed him. And I, I hesitate to admit this, but it's absolutely true. I grieved more over that dog than I've grieved over most family members when they died. You know, I, I, it took me forever to get my head right after, after Max got killed. So we followed him with another boxer who looked just like him, was, looked like his twin. I mean, you know, you can barely tell them apart. And I did not love him. He was insane. I discovered that something I had never understood, which is that there are some dogs who are mentally ill. And we didn't have any Prozac or any, you know, Adderall or anything to give this dog. And he was nuts. You know, and he just about ate up and killed everything in the neighborhood. We gave him to some people next door to us who owned a farm. They said, let us take him because he can't live in civilized society. Let's, we'll take him out to our farm up in the Nash, Daniel Boone National Forest. He's going to have 150 acres up there. He can run around. He can't hurt anything there. They turned him loose up there and he liked to kill everything up there. <laughs> he ate up the other dogs in the neighborhood. One of their neighbor had fighting cocks, you know, the, the, the roosters. And he went over there and got on their property, killed all the roosters. He was nuts. He was a psychopathic dog. Okay, So you encounter the Lord through the pets. Sometimes you encounter the devil through the pets. But you can learn a lot of spiritual truth through those pets. Somebody said, and I, don't, I didn't make myself a notation as to where I wrote this down. I think this has came from Richard Rohr, those of you who are Richard Rohr fans said, God created millions of creatures for many millions of years before human beings came along. Many of these beings are too tiny for us to see or have yet to be discovered. Some have seemingly no benefit to human life, and many, like the dinosaurs, lived and died long before we did. Why did they even exist? A number of the Psalms say that creation exists simply to reflect and give glory to God. Psalm, example, Psalm 104. The deepest meaning of creation and creatures is their naked existence itself. God has chosen to communicate his very self in the multitudinous and diverse shapes of beauty, love, truth, and goodness, each of which manifests another facet of the divine. Now, that's a wordy way of saying this. When I had Max, and I had a pony like that when I was a kid, but when I had Max that I loved like that, but when Max, the good boxer, the godly boxer, the dog, was with me, I learned a lot from him, and I found God in him because I thought, you know, God just created this animal just to be. He doesn't work. He doesn't, you know, he just eats and sleeps and, you know, swarps around the house and that's about all he does but you know i didn't expect anything out of him and what i really liked is if i sat down to watch tv or i sat down to read or whatever he would want to get right up beside me and flop down beside me and lay his head in my lap and all that and i would think sometimes this must be the way again god feels about us you know he just delights in us 
being with him. He just wants us to love him and he wants to pat on us and bless us. And you can find God there. Some theologians, Billy Graham is not a theolo was not a theologian, but he was an evangelist. Billy Graham said, and, and uh, John Wesley, the Methodist theologian, said, we will have pets in heaven. That there will be dogs and cats or whatever, some other form of pets in heaven. And not only that, they will not be bound by the limitations of this earth, and they'll be able to talk to us, and we'll be able to talk to them. God just likes creating stuff. God just likes making cool stuff. We can also find God, number five, if you're writing these down or keeping score at home or whatever you're doing. Number five, we find God in our jobs, in our work. We experience both the highs and lows in our work. God meant for us to labor as a way of providing for our needs and the needs of others less fortunate than ourselves. You can see God in your job, and you say, no, I, you can't see job, God in my job. <laughs> you can. You can find God in your job. You know, every time you get a paycheck, that's one way the Lord is providing for your needs. You're not really working for that company. You're not working for that boss. You're working for the Lord. That company is not your source of supply. And every time you get that paycheck, you look at it and you think, thank you, God. You took care of me another week. We, you encounter him in your co-workers. You see him as you're trying to deal with a troublesome problem or a, an idiot boss. You know, I'm not saying God's the idiot boss, but you have to turn to God to deal with the idiot boss. God is always living and moving among us, even on the assembly line or in the office or wherever it is. If you can shut out the noise and go into your spiritual center, you know what I mean? Go into your happy place and just say, God, show me where you are in this workplace today. You'll find that God is there. When I used to work full time, at the newspaper, for example, I worked in the newsroom, and uh, we didn't interact too much with the advertising department or the circulation department or whatever. It wasn't that we weren't allowed to talk to those people. It was just they had their job and we had ours, and the two jobs didn't overlap much. But I under I uh, got to be friends with a guy back in the circulation department. They worked back on kind of in the back of the building on the same floor that we did. And he was a circulation manager of some kind. And it turned out he was a fellow preacher. And he not only was a fellow preacher, he was a fellow preacher who believed a lot of the same stuff that I believe. You know, this is sad to say, it probably says more about me than it does other people, and I probably shouldn't admit this again, but I am. Um, I don't generally like preachers. You know, I just, I, I am one, but I don't really have a lot of preacher friends because a lot of preachers kind of get on my nerves, you know. And, uh, but he and I got to be really good friends. And I couldn't wait to see him when I would go to work, you know. He always had something insightful to say or he had been listening to a tape of some other preacher that he knew that he would pass on to me. That was in the days when you had cassette tapes. This is how long ago that's been. He'd say, man, I was listening to this sermon. I made a copy for you. You need to listen to this on your way home. It'll blow you right out of the tub. And I'd listen to it. He was always right. I listened to two or three sermons he gave me that to this day are the, probably among the five or six best sermons I've ever heard in my life, you know. And so having a fellow believer there in my workplace made me look forward to finding God every day or every other day or once a week, however often I ran into him, in my workplace. And I knew that I wasn't, and of course I knew this anyway, there were a lot of good Christians there, but he and I had some kind of communion there. And I knew when he was there, 
I wasn't alone. You know what I mean? I, they, it was like two are stronger than one. And I could find God in my workplace through Lamont. Number six, we can find God in nature. A lot of people find God in nature primarily. There's a, I was reading something that a rabbi wrote, Rabbi Noah Galenkin. I don't even know who he is. I just read this. And he says he, he had written a thing in a book in 1973 that said, God, where are you? Where do I find you? You do not live here. You have no address. But the universe is filled with your glory. You live in every mountain and in every valley. And on the busy turnpike outside, you live in the beautiful riot of many colors of the Indian summer, and you live in my soul. We find God many times. We encounter God through his creation. God so loved the world. One of the things that, that it continually moves and impresses me is the wonder of and the majesty with, it, with which he created the universe. And he created this land. I don't mean just America. I mean the earth. He created, as, as I was reading earlier, you know, little amoebas and he, little plants. And every one of them has their own story. And Paul says in Romans, each one of those bears the image of God. You know, when you start reading about atoms or you start reading about quantum physics or you look at biology, you know, it'll blow you away to see the miraculous way God is manifest in his creation. I was never very scientifically minded and still I am not. But when I was at UK, I had to take a biology class or some kind of science class that had to do you know, with my general studies, you have to have so many hours across the curriculum. So I had to take a class and somebody told me, take, take human biology. That's the best one. That's the one you can get through that. And it's really interesting. And so I took this class at UK. It was a big class held in kind of a, an amphitheater. The guy who taught it was a medical doctor. And it was all about the biology of the human body. And this has been 40 plus years ago. And I still remember how this blew me away. One thing he liked to talk about was the human heart. And he said, I remember him saying one day, the human heart is essentially a pump. That's all it does. It pumps blood. It's about the size of your fist and it pumps that blood through your body. And he said, so when you think of the heart, just think of a pump. That's what it's doing. But he said, here's the thing. He said, your heart pumps 60, 80, 100 beats every minute. Boom, 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 boom. And nobody knows why. He said, it is driven, it is, he said, it's powered by an electrical charge. And it takes that electrical charge to stimulate your heart to pump. And it pumps regularly, just as regularly as clockwork, 80 beats a minute for however many years you live because of that electrical charge going off. 80 times a minute in your body somewhere that turns on that heart. But he says nobody on earth knows where that electrical charge comes from or how it got there. And I was thinking about this. I actually looked this up when I was preparing for this sermon. So if you live to be 80 years old and your heart beats 80 times a minute for 80 years, your heart will beat in the course of your lifetime 3.3 billion times your heart beats if you live to be 80 years old. 3.3 billion times stimulated 
by an electrical charge, but unless you've got a pacemaker or something, you don't have a battery in your chest. You're not hooked to the wall socket. I hope if you are, it may be a whole lot more or a whole lot less of that. But your heart is just boom, 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 year after year, millions of times, then billions of times, it just keeps going. You know what I think the electrical charge is? God. You know? And so we find him. Poets and mystics have encountered the Lord in the woods, in the mountains, in burning bushes, in the babbling of a stream. It's funny, you know, God is in his universe. And if you open your eyes, Paul says in Romans that people who don't know God and don't, don't uh, have an experience God, he says in Romans, are without excuse. You can't say, I never heard the gospel Therefore, I don't know who God, Paul says, because all you have to do is open your eyes and look at his creation, and you can see him no matter where you are or where you live. You can see him every time you walk through the woods, basically. Amen? Okay, number seven. We find God, we encounter God in music. All right? Music is one of the great places. And that is because God himself loves music. However many scriptures there are, I, can't, I couldn't tell you a number, but scripture after scripture, particularly in the Psalms, but in uh, Revelation everywhere else, talks about how God is surrounded by angels providing music 24-7 through all eternity. God likes some background music. And you know, those angels, That's a lot of those angels, that's their whole job. It's just firing God up with some good music. Amen? And so sometimes you encounter God through worship music. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Praise Group. You know that what a blessing that is? But I don't know about you. I find God through all kinds of different music, you know, that can just set my mind going on the Lord. Generally, it's John Prine, who I'm satisfied was a prophet of God, even though he didn't know it, wasn't a Christian, I don't think. But, I mean, if it's worth saying, he said it, you know. And it, uh, that's, that's my worship music. I love, you know, I can get in touch with God through that. Or Billy Joe Shaver, <laughs> that's another one. But he speaks to our souls through music. When your spirits get down, if you put on some good, lively music, you know, some good, whatever your favorite Motown is or worship music or whatever it is, you can't stay in a bad mood. It does something to change our hearts. And I think that goes all the way back to the Lord, to creation, to before creation. Number eight, we find God in our setbacks. You want to find God? Look at your failures. Look at your illness. Look at the death of a loved one. Look at the time you lost a job. Look at that when that child goes astray. Frustrations in your marriage. Whatever it is that you're going through that's not altogether pleasant. You know what happens a lot of times when we go through really bad stuff? We turn to the Lord. Because that's the only place to turn. And so I'm not saying God causes these things, but he says that we live in a universe in which unpleasant things are going to happen. When they do happen, they many times, if we have a spirit that seeks God anyway, those things turn us more closely toward God. What happens is you'll find his comfort or you'll see him redeeming good from a bad situation. You'll lose your job, and then he'll open a door, and you'll walk into a much better job than you ever imagined having. And you see that God was taking care of you all along. And if nothing else, you at least find the embrace of his strong arms holding you up. I've been through a few things in my life, and I'm sure you have too, where I, when I got on the other side of them, I became convinced looking back that the only way I made it 
was that the Lord had to have been holding me up. I could not have done that on my own. It had to be him. He was there in the darkness holding me up. And I, you know, I encountered his love and care. The ninth place that we encounter God is we also encounter God in our victories because as the prophet John Prine said, that's the way the world goes round. You're up one day and the next you're down, you know, and we all have our setbacks and defeats and we all have our successes. When you succeed, when you make a great decision, when you win an award from the mayor, when you find the one true love of your life, whatever it is that's a great success in your life, you also find the Lord there. Many times the Lord will carry us through something and we look at it and we think, man, that had to have been God. That had to be God. God, how did you do that? Wow, I didn't see that coming. And then finally, basically, this is the catch-all, number 10, we find God, we encounter God wherever we are. Even sometimes when it feels like hell, we're in hell. You know, Psalm 139 says, even if you make your bed in hell, God is there. His presence is there because whatever it is or wherever it exists, he is God over all. And so in every situation, wherever we are, if we're there, God is there. Okay, because he's in us. And if we open our eyes, we can see see him. I wanted to end, I, won't, I don't like to read to other people because I know it's easy for your attention to wander and, and, you know, all that. But this is a piece I wrote back in 2003 that I had forgotten about until I was preparing this sermon. That's one of the best examples I know of of God just showing up in the most unexpected place. If You know, if we look around, this is about my niece, uh, Kristen, who many of you, some of you know from back in the day, and uh, a situation that she went through. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I wanted to just tell you this story. It says, my niece, Kristen, is a bright and beautiful young woman. She plans to earn a master's degree in social work and eventually a PhD in clinical psychology. Plus, she's a dead ringer for actress Halle Berry. Shortly after she received her bachelor's degree, Kristen, 23, was offered a job in Cincinnati working as a therapist to groups of troubled children. The pay was great and the job would give her hands-on clinical experience, so she decided to postpone graduate school. A lifelong churchgoer, she believed God had opened up this opportunity for her. Once she would relocated, Kristen discovered the job wasn't as ideal as she thought it would be. The children with whom she was working were more troubled than she would anticipated. They required strong medication, which they sometimes refused to take. Several were violent. Kristen found herself breaking up fist fights. She was assaulted. Worse, her supervisors were so stressed that they weren't much easier to deal with than the kids. Kristen worried whether she'd made the right decision in moving away from her family and putting off graduate school. She wondered whether she could, should quit her job. Her professional problems started carrying over into other areas of her life. One day after work, she was an emotional shambles. She headed for her boyfriend's house. His mother was cooking dinner for them. Kristen arrived in a foul mood. She didn't like any of the food. While the others ate, Kristen went off to sit alone in the den. After dinner, she and her boyfriend got into an argument. Kristen realized it was her fault. She was so wrung out that nothing anyone could do was going to please her. I'm leaving, she told her boyfriend. I'm going to stop and get some beer, go home and drink it, and then go to sleep. She drove toward the home she shares with her stepsister and her stepsister's husband. On the way, she saw a liquor store, veered into the parking lot, and pulled up to the drive-thru window. 
A woman she'd never met opened the glass. Give me a six pack of Miller Lite, Kristen said. The woman walked away. She returned without the six pack. Honey, the woman said, your job is going to be just fine. Don't you worry. God's got a plan for you. You're in the right place. Don't doubt yourself. Kristen stared at her dumbfounded. Do you go to church? The woman said. Do you go to a charismatic church? Kristen laughed. Well, yeah, I mean, I was raised in that kind of church. I moved up here a few months ago, and I haven't been to church anywhere recently. The woman explained that when she'd started for the cooler to fetch Kristen's beer, God had told her to give Kristen a message from him instead. The Lord said, speak to her and tell her everything's going to be fine. The woman went on to say that she and her husband owned the liquor store and that she attended a non-denominational church where the gifts of the Holy Spirit, including several and including personal prophecies, opened, operated freely. Do you still want the beer? The lady said. You can keep it, Chris said, and drove away. She told me this story a few days later on the phone. Her faith had been rejuvenated. Everything she was saying was just hitting me right in the heart, Kristen said. It was so clear. It basically just lifted a, a load off my shoulders. Her job seemed brand new. I've always loved that story, even though I'd forgotten about it for a while, because the last place that I personally would probably expect to encounter the Lord and get a word of prophecy or a word of knowledge from him would be at the drive through window in a liquor store. Can you say amen? amen? They got spirits there, but not the same spirit that we're generally looking for. But the Lord knew just what she needed right at the moment she needed it and was waiting to meet her in that woman who opened the drive through window even at the liquor store. Wherever we are, the Lord is. Amen. And if we can open our eyes, we will find him there. Amen. 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 Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then don't jump up and run because we're going to celebrate communion. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to remember that you are wherever we are. And Lord, we can see you and we can meet you and we can experience you in all manner of places and times, in all the things you've given us from our pets to our kids to our church, and help us to have eyes to see you. And as we celebrate communion this morning, let this be like the body and blood of Jesus flowing through us. Let us encounter you in this communion this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Everybody, if you've got your communion. Oh, yeah, we'll wait. If you don't have it, you can get it out there in the room. good now? All right. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he met with the disciples in that upper room and he broke the bread and he said to them, take eat, for this is my body broken on your behalf. same time he took the cup and he said drink of this all of you this is my blood shed on your behalf and everybody said amen let's go to the lord one more time father in jesus name we thank you again for the body and the blood of jesus and the encounter we have with you every time we celebrate communion together. And I praise you and thank you for it, Lord. Give us open ears and open eyes to receive your body and blood. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Amen. Uh-oh.